Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. As an attorney, I specialize, and I've mentioned once, twice before maybe, that I actually have handled a few cases in different fields, including a couple divorce cases. And I vowed never to get involved in them again because divorce cases can get so out of hand. And uh, Michael sent me notes to Steve, check out this bizarre divorce case from, uh, from Utah, from Utah. Custody ruling of intimate photos in Utah divorce case violating, the ex-wife says. So the couple gets a divorce, and one of the things that they're arguing over is who gets the pictures. Who gets the pictures? Now, I've heard of other things people have fought over, but I suppose in this day and age, this was bound to happen sooner or later. So from KSL.com, Caitlin Bancroft wrote this, and it was a difficult divorce, according to those who know. And the woman and her now ex-husband were married for 25 years, but they'd been together for 27. So dividing the assets included negotiations and a one-day bench trial. So they resolved everything they could on their own, but they got stuck on a couple things. So they went in front of the judge, and they had a one-day bench trial. The judge made some rulings based on the evidence that got put in. And um, the wife, ex-wife, says that she made some concessions because she simply wanted out. She wanted out. So the judge ordered her to surrender intimate photos of herself and to surrender them to a photographer so they could be edited and then give the edited photos to her ex-husband. And of course, the ex-wife now feels that she's been violated here because these photographs are intimate, as we say. She said, you don't know where to turn because you don't know the law, and you have not only your ex-husband, who we were married to for years, thinking of forcing you to distribute basically adult images is okay. You have his attorney that also thinks that's okay, and then you bring it in front of a judge, and he thinks it's okay. So a finding of facts dated back in July, which is the day the divorce was finalized, states that the judge ruled the photos were given as gifts by the ex-wife to the ex-husband earlier in their marriage. And therefore, he has the right to retain them and the memories they provide. And this is an issue which, if you think about it, there's a lot of stuff. I'm talking about tangible objects that people acquire during a marriage. And the question is, is it owned jointly by them, or are these things given as gifts back and forth? So you give your wife jewelry, uh, it's, it's presumably it's a gift that, that you know she wears jewelry, you probably don't wear the same kind of jewelry, okay? Probably. But I, I know it's possible, but the point is that we know what I'm talking about here. The document, the ruling of the court, continues that she has the right for the intimate photos to not be in her ex-husband's possession. So the judge ordered her to turn the images over to the photographer who took them with instructions for the photographer to edit them. And the original photographer didn't want to get involved in this. So here's what the judge's report said. That person, the photographer, is then to do whatever it takes to modify the pages of the pictures so that any photographs of the petitioner, ex-wife, in lingerie or that sort of thing, or even without clothing, are obscured and taken out. But the photo inscriptions are maintained for the memory's sake. So apparently, there's photographs, they're racy, and then there's inscriptions. The judge is saying he has the right to these photographs, but because of the intimate nature of them, the photographer is to remove the portions that involve her, and leave the inscriptions behind. So the original photographer at first declined to do this because they were concerned about possible repercussions to the business and ethical issues, uh, and apparently said that being a boudoir photographer, her clients trust her with their images and privacy, and she takes that seriously. I'm not quite sure how the photographer would think that touching up photographs after the fact when asked to do so by a court causes problems. But, you know, so in a later ruling, 
the judge ordered the ex-wife to give the images to a different photographer for editing. She was also ordered to retain the original photos for 90 days before destroying them in case the ex-husband wasn't satisfied with the edits according to the divorce decree dated June 27th. So there was a, a follow-up order because the judge said, give them back to the photographer, have the photographer fix them. Photographer says, I don't want to get involved. They go back to court, the judge says, fine, give them to somebody else, have somebody else fix them. So the ex-wife now said her ex-husband chose a new photographer without any input from her, and she believes the new photographer is somebody he knew. Eventually, though, the original photographer agreed to do this, and the ex-wife said she is humiliated that she still even had to look at these photos again from years ago and has to edit the photos and was even involved in this in any way. Now, the ex-wife said her understanding based on communications between attorneys is that her ex-husband isn't happy with the now edited photos, though she feels that she has complied with the court's order. And you understand what some of this means, is that it's possible that the judge has got to look at this. And I mean, literally look at this. Because one side saying we edited the photos as you requested. The other side saying no, no they didn't. How can the judge tell without looking at the photos? And it might be that the ex-wife doesn't want everybody and his brother, as they say, looking at these photos, trying to determine how embarrassing they might be for somebody else. So she also feels her ex-husband's insistence on having the photos in any form is an attempt to control and hurt her. She says if all he was truly interested in was the inscriptions, he got those. I've complied with the court's order, even though I believe strongly that the order is violating on many levels and has affected my emotional and mental health. I can't imagine doing this to someone else. Now, with little recourse left, she said she wants to share her story so others know how intimate photos can be abused. And keep in mind, I've talked before about this, that you acquire a lot of stuff in your marriage. And a lot of the stuff is simply property. Property. I'm not talking about real estate, but I'm talking about just stuff. Property, right? This, this is the thing. This is property. Who gets this thing? Who gets this widget? And so photographs are like anything else. They're things. And where there's often a debate comes down to animals, pets. So the couple acquires a dog and they get a divorce. Who gets the dog? And a lot of people think of that in terms of like custody or something. But of course, it's not custody. It's not a child. It's an animal. And animals at law are often treated as if they're simply property. I have seen divorce decrees entered with courts that say specifically who gets the dog. And as you can imagine, a lot of that only resulted in being there after a whole lot of wrangling. So... Uh, here the ex-wife says, I'm scared, but I want to be brave and protect other people from feeling the things I've had to feel. Exes cannot be allowed to ask for such inappropriate things. Their attorneys need to counsel their clients in a non-harmful, cohesive way. And judges need to uphold the law they swore to protect. Uh, the question I have for you is, uh, how do you feel a judge is not upholding the law? Because he's got two people in front of him, and it appears they agree that she gave a gift to him and said, here, this is a gift. It's yours. Keep it. And now it's an unusual gift in the sense that it's not like a gift of jewelry that you might wear to a party, but it is, in fact, things that were given to the other side. And yes, I understand that there's a sense of nature there, but the point is that the judge with the law and following the law is going to say, well, Unless there's case law on this, and I doubt that there is just yet. Uh, question is, who gets these things? And these things were given as a gift by one party to the other. Now, the judge thought he got a compromise by saying, well, how about this? We'll take them back from him temporarily, and we will blur out all of the racy stuff and then give it back to him. And yeah, that process might involve somebody else looking at these photographs, but remember the judge's original order was, we'll have the photographer who took the pictures do that. Now, I know you're going to say, you're gonna, Steve, what about people in the future who may have taken the pictures themselves? And that would be an issue because it might be that they themselves made the pictures. So another story altogether, not everyone's good at Photoshop. Uh, she also recognized that some people will criticize her for having the photos shot in the first place. But she said that what she decided to do in her marriage is no one else's business. And I don't think many people will quibble with that. I think most people are going to say if a wife 
wants to get these photographs taken as a gift for her husband. I, I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of people screaming and yelling about that. So uh, that was a gift between a husband and a wife, she said. I protect my privacy and my body, and it's not something I share with anyone. Now, the ex-husband says that her account is from her own perspective. He said, this is not my perspective, nor the perspective of an impartial judge. It appears that she has intentionally misrepresented and sensationalized several aspects of a fair proceeding to manipulate the opinions of others for attention and validation of victimhood. Now, KSL attempted to reach the judge for comment, but director of communications for the court system said judges do not discuss specific cases. So if you want to discuss the case, all you can do is go read the orders and whatever else uh, is in the court file that's public. Uh, meanwhile, a criminal law professor at the University of Utah College of Law said it's very strange that a judge would require someone to turn over sensitive photos of herself to a stranger for editing. Uh, asset division during divorce always involves a balancing of interests, he said. In my opinion, the judge here has just made a mistake in the balancing of interests and has tipped things much too far in one direction. However, he said the judge was sensitive to the risk of the photos being used to blackmail or intimidate her, given that he ordered her body and identifying features be blurred out. So I'm not quite sure what this professor's getting at, because if everyone had gone with what the judge had originally said, which is what they eventually did do, is the photographs were sent back to the photographer who took them. So that photographer, seeing those photographs, it wasn't the first time that it happened. The photographer was there when the photographs were taken. So I don't think that that's really a, a fair representation here. Now, the professor said what he believes the judge missed uh, is that each viewing of these photographs is an invasion of privacy. But again, if they'd been viewed by somebody else, yes. But by the photographer, I don't think so. And that is what ultimately happened. So the uh, professor said sensitive photos can have shelf lives that extend far beyond what people intended when they made the images. In this case, it's tricky because the photos were originally shared consensually, but were then ordered to be transmitted non-consensually. So ideally, the third party would have handled the images in a sensitive and responsible way, but every transmission creates a risk of distribution, either accidentally or intentionally. And uh, there have been stories in the news of people who used to take photographs to places like Kmart and Walmart for developing. And uh, they would take uh, sensitive photographs and they would then go pick up those photographs. And they'd discover later that the person running the machine had kicked out three or four extra copies of each good photograph and were handing them out to their friends. And that would happen quite often. The woman here added that anyone else going through a similar situation shouldn't be afraid to ask for help. Rely on friends, see a therapist, and fight for yourself. For her, coping means staying as positive as possible. You deal with it the best you can with the tools that you have. For me, that's just trying to hold a heart of gratitude and be grateful for the good things you have in your life. This is only one small thing in my life, but I have so many more positive things to be grateful for. Uh, in her case, contributes to an ongoing dialogue about how sensitive photos are shared. And of course, we had the Kobe Bryant case not so long ago uh, with sensitive photographs. We're making a very, very large category there. But these being intimate, racy photographs, another thing altogether. But yeah, so it's something to think about. And unfortunately, very few people ever spend much time in their marriage wondering if it's going to all come crashing down later on down the road. And so what happens is, during the period in which you're happy, you assume that'll never happen. And later on, when there's signs of trouble, you've already done the things like this, that later on you'll kick yourself for. But as of right now, it appears that the photographs have been edited. And unfortunately, it looks like one of the parties thinks they weren't edited properly. And it may be that the judge has got to look at them to see if he thinks they've been edited properly. And that would now put them in front of at least one other party. And like I said, you know, courts are faced with extremely difficult situations. And there are a variety of reasons why divorce cases can be so contentious. And one of them simply is that, you know, most, most marriages begin in a ceremony in a church or out in a park or someplace where it's being officiated, but they end in courthouses. They end in courtrooms. They end with litigation. 
And so it's kind of difficult for a court to, and unfortunately they have to, but for a court to look at two people and say, fine, I'll grant you the divorce. Let's divide up all your stuff. And then when we get down to the things that we can't divide up, we'll have a trial on it. And there are some things that cannot be divided. And then the question becomes, well, if you can't divide it, is it even possible to do this where both sides will be happy? And the answer is, of course, no. And is there a way to do it in which it's fair? And the best that the courts can do is, well, we'll do it in a way that's the most fair compared to the alternatives. So great examples are, let's suppose the couple owns a house. While they're married, they built their dream house. They built their dream house. Who gets the dream house if both parties want it at the end of the divorce? And I know what you're going to say, Steve, sell it and split the proceeds. Well, that's one possible answer, but that doesn't resolve the fact that it was their dream house they built. And is it right that neither of them gets it? And then, of course, there's other things. And, and one of the memes that I've seen floating around the internet out there is the couple dividing up their beanie babies on the floor of a courtroom. And several people sent that to me a while back, and I assumed it was a joke. It turns out it was real. And so that's the whole point. You look at the photograph of the two people in the courtroom, on their knees, hands and knees on the floor, dividing up Beanie Babies. And you ask yourself, number one, do you think they ever imagined it would get to this back when they're exchanging vows? But number two, it's just stuff, but... It can be very, very personal to those people. And so to me, a beanie baby is like, huh? I, I, I don't know if I've ever touched a beanie baby in my life. I know what they are. I've heard of them. But to these two people on their hands and knees in the courtroom being supervised by somebody, clearly to them, it's quite important. And so to ask a judge to step in where each couple is going to have its own basket of trouble and divide everything up as best you can. And by the way, we're not even talking about children yet. <laughs> Just talking about the stuff they've acquired. It can be a nightmare. So this is interesting because I'd never thought of this one before. Because the next question is, what if the photographs, and i got to be careful here, what if the photographs were of the couple? In other words, this right here is boudoir photographs taken by a third party of one of the parties. Right? Husband, wife, photographer. Photographer takes the photographs of the wife. She gives them to the husband. What if the couple shot the photographs themselves or perhaps a moving motion picture themselves? Who owns that? What becomes of that? That's another problem, which of course would be more of an advanced move than this. We'll see what happens because that would be a tricky one. Because if the couple could say, well, I'm in there and... You know, I shot this, and the other one says, but I'm in it also, and I also shot it. And the court might say, well, it's digital. Make a copy for each of you. But then what happens? So a lot of stuff can pop up here, and just when you think you've heard it all, something new comes along. People often say, Steve, why is the law so confusing? Because by now, aren't there laws that cover everything? Yeah, but then along come new facts. So there you go. Michael, thanks for sending this from ksl.com. Custody ruling of intimate photos in Utah divorce case violating, says the ex-wife. And Caitlin Bancroft wrote that. Questions or comments? Put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. Travel light. Don't carry the weight of the world on your shoulders.